I don't want to live with regrets of I should have tried or I wonder what would have happened if I'd have did this and I wonder what would have happened if yeah. I don't want to live like that. And then too, like I'm just good at what I do. Evidently, it's, people like it, right? So I ain't forcing nothing on nobody. People asking me for the music, so yeah, I'm giving it to them. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of a podcast for creative people. I am creative person Christopher Talon, and this week I brought some weed from Farmhouse Wellness over to the studio and met up with Alfie the Great, and I'll let him introduce himself. I go by Alfie the Great. I represent Grand Rapids, Michigan, Black Rose Society. What the Black Rose Society means is, uh, in most cultures, the Black Rose is a symbol of death or something bad, right? But in some cultures, a Black Rose is a symbol of hope or a new beginning. So that's what we represent. Right now, it's a hope and a new way of life and a new beginning for people. So we're going to push that culture for whatever you're doing in your life. It's a new beginning. Every day, you got a new opportunity. You don't have to be what you was yesterday. So Alfie and I actually met at the Gramatones grand opening. You might remember Gramatones from my past guest, Dante Cope, who's been on the show a couple of times. And then also, we met through Scoob, who was on the show talking about the Trauma Project. Alfie the Great is one of the rappers on the Trauma Project. And yeah, after we bounced around and kept, <laughs> kept bumping into each other, I was like, hey man, come on the podcast. And I'm really glad he did. We had a great conversation. And before I play that conversation, I want to give you all of his information should you want to follow him, get his merch and all that kind of stuff. So here's that. We got merch on Up Nation. If you go to uplifenation.com, you can buy my t-shirts and my hoodies right now. They're on uh, uplifenation.com. BRS by ADG. That's what you look it up under. All my social media is our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Threads, and TikTok. Alfie the Great. A-L-F-I-E-D-A, capital G-R-E-A-T. All together. You don't have to space it. All right, folks. You know what to do when you're done listening to this. Go out, listen to The Trauma Project, catch Alfie's song on that, and follow Alfie the Great, check out all his music, watch his videos on YouTube, all that stuff. All right, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started talking about his writing process and see where it goes from there. And stick around till the end of the podcast and hear the whole song that you're about to hear a clip of now called Different Clout by Alfie the Great. What the fuck the riff's about? It's only getting worse. I used to try to hear him out. Sometimes you let him in just so you can hear him out. It's far as rappers go. I didn't kill the pair. I'm more like it. I don't even need a beat to rap. To, most of the time, I don't even write to a beat. I might be just sitting on the couch and just open my phone. I might just, because I don't write. I sh- I'm I'm trying to train myself to write more rigorous. Yeah. Well, I write when I feel when when it when it come. I don't have a certain time I want to write. I don't have a certain topic I want to write about. I just do you, write what I feel at the moment. So, uh, I just talked to Scoob the other day, and I want to talk about the trauma project a little bit with you too because you were on that. So this is maybe a good time as any. With that, was that a song that you already had written? Destiny. Uh, the song's called Trapped in... Uh, trapped in My Thoughts. Trapped in My Thoughts. Sorry, I was going to say Trapped in My Head, but I was like, that's not right. Feature Huff the Goat. Yeah. So with a song like that, is that something you already had or when you were presented with the idea? Because it seems to me like it would be harder to write to somebody else's idea, but if you can really lock in with it, then it doesn't really matter whose idea it was. Well, that that was Destiny, right? It's funny how that worked. Because <laughs> when school approached me about that, and he told me with the with the I had a verse that I had just the verse I I spit I had just literally wrote that verse like right before he asked me, hmm. right. That's one of those things that makes you go, okay, maybe there's something to this metaphysical stuff and yeah, uh, right. Like it, it was just de- it was just it, destiny or fate. Call it dumb luck, right? Like, yeah. He asked me about it. I knew I had it on deck, so he asked me would I be interested. Hell yeah, I'm interested because I already got something <laughs> for it, right? So that's what that's what it was, and he actually showed me the painting and everything, because that's what's so dope about the trauma project, right? The the trauma project, what I try to explain to people is, it's like, even the people that's involved in this project, like, this is not just a, a typical hip hop album that you just listen to, like you pop it on, and you can stream it, and you listen to it, and it's okay, it's cool. But if you really get the to get the whole experience of the trauma project, if you can see when you get to see the art itself, and then you get to see when you see the visual art and the performance art merged together and then you get to see the, the artist performing and you really get to see the encompass the whole thing, then you'll get the understanding of what the trauma project is when people 
these these guys and these ladies on these uh, songs are addressing trauma issues that they never talked about with nobody else ever. They never even tried. Most of them never even tried to talk about these things in a song prior to this. You know what I'm saying? So these people are being raw, candid, and emotional for the first time. Yeah. So when you see it and you can, and, and the energy in the room, you, you've you been in one, right? Yeah. So you know, like, you know, like the experience, it is different. Writing songs. You said that a lot of times you'll write without a beat. So you've just, you've got something in your head. Do you start more with um, kind of a linear idea and then figure out how to break that up into a, or does it just come into your mind like with those poetic beats to them already? I don't have a plan when I write. I don't know what, I, I don't have no, like I said, I don't have any preconceived, like I don't say, oh, I'm going to rap about uh, pink boxes today. Yeah. I just, I don't even know when I'm going to write. I just never know. It just come out. Like I might get inspired by something like, man, oh, and then I just go on my phone and I'll call it writing, but yeah. go on my phone and write it on my phone. Same thing. Yeah, same thing. But yeah, I'll just use my phone now. So I do that and just, I, I never have no, no, that's how my creative process is. It just come when it come. And of course, I mean, once I started with a topic, I mean, my brain's going to go to that. But you think in terms of lines and stanzas and like beat repetitions and things like a dun and 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 a dun. Yeah, because my wordplay going to determine the BPMs of what I use as far as production wise, right? Maybe a better way to ask the question that I was trying to get at, and I think you're going to get into it, is do you hear something in your head that just kind of has a sound and flow to it? Or do you kind of see the beat and then try to no i think it's no, that's a bad way to ask that question too but maybe you know what i'm talking about it's, i hear what you're trying to ask me but how i created this it's not it's not it's not predetermined at all that's what i'm telling you like so it's like what they call a football or basketball read and react right mm -hmm. so once whatever sparks me to say the first because in hip-hop your your first line got to be fire yeah so whatever the first the first setup is whatever however you open up the first is going to determine how you rap rap the song yeah. So once I once I get the first bar out, it's going that's going to determine what I'm talking about and what I'm and what I'm opening up with, right? So now I have to correlate everything around that. That's just rule of thumb for hip hop. You stay on subject matter. You can't say Beavis and Butthead and then end mm -hmm. up on mm -hmm. Randy Stimpy, right? Like you you right. gotta you gotta stay kick some 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 Beavis lines and some some Butthead ad libs, right? You're gonna build it up. When I do write lyrics for songs. Like, it's not rap. It's a lot slower, like, like, and it takes me a long time to come out with just like two like the lines. Trauma Project song, like the verse for that, right? What I say, I say, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty, so I live with regret. That was the first line. Hindsight's twenty twenty, so I live with regret. So I knew from right then and there, that was the pace. The the bar set the pace. So now I just have to fill in like nah, it's a blank canvas. Now I just got to fill it in with the details. Yeah. And you just know where those you, you gonna hear it. This is gonna come where those right? beats got to be. Yeah, you, you could. And then you you start building on to that because that's how I do. I I say that hindsight's twenty twenty. So I live with regret. I don't know, like in real time when I wrote it, did I have the next bar already ready or not, or did I sit there and think for a minute and didn't come out, or because usually I write in spurts. Mm -hmm. I really I try not to force what I'm gonna say to if it if I don't feel it, I don't. I just stop. Yeah. If once you start getting no, that's not gonna work. That's Hmm. Or, or, I'm just start, or it's starting to sound second. like what we call filler bars, like where you just saying something just to pass time to come up with the next clever line. Like it's really no substance in what you really just said. Mm. I try not to use filler bars. Like I really want to be. But you was asking me about my conviction. That's why I rap the way I rap. Like I don't want to use filler bars. I, I, I want you to really believe everything I'm saying. Like I ain't saying nothing because it sound cool. Yeah. The cliche is things. Like some people's voice is so dope they can say oodles and noodles, and you be like, man, it's fire. <laughs> You, did you hear what he said? He said oodles and noodles. <laughs> just because his voice is good. <coughs> or he know how to ride it, or he know how to ride the beat a certain way. <laughs> oodles and noodles. Oodles and noodles. I'll snatch your poodle. All right. <laughs> He's famous. Uh, so like I just create from once again, just fill in the blanks, bro. Like once I open a line, cause you know the opening line gotta be good and the closing line gotta be good. So, yeah. So they gotta be equal. Mm-hmm. Or one guy to be better than the other, but something to grab someone's attention, some something to keep them thinking about it when it's done. Yeah. yeah. Just stamp it. And then the rest. It's like building a car. Right? 
Got the engine together. Now you got to make sure that transmission is good. The suspension is good. You know it's going to roll. Will you write things down often and then go, mm, no? Or do you think it, think each thing out in your head first and then go, okay, that's good. And then actually commit it to, you know, your phone or your, or whatever. I write it in my phone. Cause like I said, like I was trying to tell you, I, I mean, but I mean like, do you, will you go back and edit a lot or do you kind of yep, wait I until edit. it feels clean in your head first? Nope. I edit as I go, but I won't, that's what I'm saying. When I'm writing, I'll, I'll be, if it don't, cause once, like I said, once you get that first bar, you already got a pace. So it got everything else got to fit in that pace. Right? Yeah. So boom. So what, whatever I'm wrapping it in. So by the time I get eight, eight bars in, I know I'm gonna have to stop and think of something else. Right. So I'm gonna have to reset and then I'll go read everything. So by the time I get done with the verse, I'll know it. Yeah. I'll literally know it in my head, right? Mm-hmm. And then then it being in my phone is just like a checkpoint. Like if if I'm in the booth and I'll just hold it right there just if just in case I might forget a word or something, it's just more like a checkpoint. And then like it ain't nothing. So you really just rapping it. So I just write it until I figure figure it all out. By the time I get to the end, I know the whole song. Yeah. Or at least the whole verse, per se. Yeah. By the time I get to the end, I'll know it. And then once I know it, or if I lay it and it come out, and you see I got my own setup, so I could just mm. lay it real quick, listen to it. If it don't sound right, but I hardly, I don't, I don't never do that. I just write it, learn it. Because once I, that's what I do too. Like I'll write a verse, right? And I'll play with it a lot. I'll rap it to like different beats. Mm-hmm. I'll just experiment with it. So like when people hear me rap too, like I do, I practice a lot. I'm not going to lie. I practice a lot. Like, I'll just wrap it to different beats, and then once I get it to something, like, oh, yeah, that's it. And then I'll just put it on that and lay it. So I think, too, like, we come in, because we come, we in that age right now where everything's instant. So they do. They want to just put whatever they they hear first, they vocals to it or whatever. No, like, try to play with it a little bit. Like, a lot of kids don't know. A lot of hit songs they heard probably had four versions be- before it became that hit. Yeah. Do you have musically in your head how the lyrics are going to sound and then – you try to find a song to match it, or will you have something where you go, "Oh, I didn't think of saying it this way, but that works with this." Or is it a little of both? Um, I can crap. That's what I'm saying by me memorizing my verse. Yeah, I can kind of adjust it to the beat. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I can I can adjust my flow to the beat. So if it's, I might write it at a certain pace, but I can spit it at a different pace because I know it. I can I can play with it. Okay, so you're not too committed to like the idea of what it sounded like in your head without without a beat behind it necessarily it's not oh no this beat doesn't sound the way that i want this to sound i mean i can rap it like you you throw pretty much any beat on i can rap uh, the same verse i can like if you throw five different beats on i can rap the same verse to five different beats sure that don't mean i'm a like off you know saying five of them right so what happens is whatever you're going to hear is what I like out of what I did. But I, I normally don't just rap to anything. That's okay. what I learned through the years. Like, Is not to try like five different things is to or figure just, out or which just one you like Or just be so quick. Like if you don't feel it, don't do it. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. James Brown said it best. You hear it, right? He said, yeah. He said, does it sound good? So yeah. He said, does it feel good? What is the argue about then? Yeah. Don't let so don't let people tell you how you should create your art or how music got to be made. Right? That's yeah. what I think we all do that too. Yeah, it's a blueprint to a certain extent, but quit trying to follow everybody's template. Yeah. If it's if it's good, it's good. Yeah, and especially what you said too. If if it doesn't feel right or it doesn't feel good, don't then it, it. then it's not right. Go <laughs> go back a couple of steps because I did the same thing with the uh, with my first book where I would started down this plot line i guess and you should teach me how to write me a book I want to write one. <laughs> all right um and i started taking the story a certain way and i remember immediately being like uh i don't know well let me keep writing and see what happens and i wrote like 80 pages and was just like no nah. and i went i knew exactly where it went off the rails and i was like i can get it back but instead i just wrote a bunch of shit and was like i'm not putting my name on that cut it off and start it over again and got what I've got now. But um, yeah, that was a big lesson for me. <laughs> something doesn't feel right. Either this doesn't belong here or you're jumping the gun and you're yeah, skipping yeah. something. Cause especially with us as men, once again, if you, if you were to, 
if you wouldn't if you wouldn't have been logical and use your emotion, you'd have wrote those eighty and put input that that first initial writing out there just off all ego and emotion. Yeah. But you thought you use your you use your logic and your intuition, right? I wish I would have used it before <laughs> I got to eighty pages, but yeah. But you but you, you needed to go there. Even but even you writing those eighty pages might have been therapy for you. Yeah. Right? It was therapeutic for you. You didn't lose, you just it took you down some shit that you yeah. you, you thought you forgot or you didn't want to address probably. And you was like, oh, this is getting kind of messy. Let me let me kill this, right? Yeah. So I can hurt a lot of or I can hurt a lot of people with this, right? So or yeah. whatever it was. I don't know what it was, right? And it was that whole experience was an exploratory yeah. kind of a thing because I had never written a book and published it and got somebody to edit it and to cover on it and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So I was like, I I just gotta make this work. It was the uncharted territories, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you said, make it work. <laughs> Figure it out. Uh. All right, that's the podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I'm just kidding. The next segment <laughs> LP and I talk about some of his earliest musical influences and uh, kind of go from there. Inspiration, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm an '80s kid, right? I'm 44 years old. I was born in 1980. I grew up listening where my mom played a lot of Motown. Yeah. My grandmother herself, my uh, maternal grandmother, was a big, big Temptations fan, so listened to a lot of Motown, Nita Baker, Sade, um, a lot of R&B soul, a lot of a lot of different music. Uh, one of my uncles was a, a real big jazz enthusiast. He's listening uh, to like Cold Train, Najee. He he liked different type of jazz, classical jazz. Cool. Thelonious Monk. Thelonious Monk. He listened Thelonious to him. Monk's my dude. That's yeah, my favorite. So, so like my uncle Al, he listened to a lot of different different music, but he was a jazz guy. Yeah, I think. But musically, I just think I have always been around music. Yeah, you know what I'm saying so. Inspiration wise, but I mean your voice in particular grabs me like some people have a really great ability to just map words to a song in a way that's interesting just in the <laughs> that it comes out but also you know matches the tone of the song um but then some people just have that voice where it's like man the i love what this person's saying but just it their voice by itself is music. You know what I mean? And you've yeah. got a great voice in that way. So that's why I wanted to present that question to you. Well, I think that's more conviction, I think, right? Um, I can, I grew up in an era where, like, rap wasn't cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was cool to do if you was good at it. Yeah. But it wasn't something to do to be considered cool. You feel me? So, like, you had to be, you had to mean, like, even our lifestyle, you got to mean what you say and say what you mean. Mm -hmm. If I'm if I'm saying leave me alone passively, nobody's believing me. But if I tell you leave me the fuck alone, <laughs> you don't <laughs> yeah. believe you. You believe you tend to believe me. My tone changed, right? Yeah. That's why Tupac was one is going to be revered as one of the greatest to ever because when you hear what he like you said when you hear his voice, the conviction in his voice alone. Yeah. He could be joking, but the conviction in your in his voice lets you know he meant every word he was saying. And his presentation too. It almost kind of reminds me of like um, like an old school Southern Baptist, like almost like a Martin Luther King, like, I have a dream. You know, like it feels like it's kind of coming out of that same kind of a register. You know what I mean? Like a yeah, very. That, that passion, right? That feeling. Yeah. Because it's, his voice can fill up the room, right? And I tell artists that too. Like even when you perform it, you can perform and not move up. Like you don't have to be moving a lot to be a great performer. Your voice can make everything do whatever you want it to do but that's just the belief i think that's more conviction i think that's passion um but do you kind of remember um like coming into your own and what what was maybe what was the sound that you were reaching before before you found your own yeah um i did um everything you're doing good no matter how great you are right you got to learn everybody starts off green mm. so um you should hear growth yeah right yeah and I, it was one particular song i can't remember exactly what it was but i could literally in the song hear it when i found my lane like when i found that groove and then from there on it was just it was more easier for me to to rap and that's where i molded myself after that because i used to rap real fast yeah and now it's like i will have to really like sit there and really craft it and practice to rap fast like like Buster Rhymes Twister fast? Yeah, I, I used to rap fast. Like, yeah, like Buster Rhymes. I used to rap, can, can rap that fast. But like now, 
I got a song on my new one I did on my new album. That's I got a I got a joint on there rapping fast, but I used to rap fast, but then I learned how to just slow it down and because I was trying to fit so much of what I was feeling and what I was thinking into a yeah. bar. Yeah, you're like I can blow people's minds by saying this much rather than like kind of finding like the most poignant piece and just going. Mm-hmm. So it's like. But back to, yeah, I just think, I think if you asking me about my inspiration as far as my voice, and then I was raised by black women, you know, uh, they passion, they passionate people. <laughs> it's like, if you ever been around an old bossy black lady, you know, and I, I mean, and that's for any, any color or any ethnicity, they tell you they got that, that old black lady that's a friend or a black friend, and she's an older lady, she's a bossy, she's, she, she control it, you know what I'm saying? So I got that, that conviction and that passion, I think. From but my, is that just what, as far as just tone and sound goes, is that just what comes out of you naturally? Or have you kind of learned that there's a certain, like, amount of breath you need to use or a certain, like, tone you're trying to kind of fit in between and keep it kind of, ah, uh, or is it just naturally smooth like that? It's, it's, this is my natural voice, but also, too, I think... I got a lot of a lot of love um let people know one thing though. Like I'm legally deaf. So I wear hearing aids. So I saw you with the, something in your ears before yeah. and the first time it was at a concert, so I was like, oh, maybe they're earplugs. Yep. These are hearing aids, right? So without these, I'm probably my hearing probably is like probably like twenty, thirty percent without these, right? So I'm legally deaf. So Was um, that from something you were born with or my, yeah, my fraternal grandmother is is completely deaf. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, my grandmother and then a lot of people on her from her kids and her bloodline, yes, were hearing age have some type of hearing disability. So it was uh I inherited it and you said through my bloodline or whatever. But um yeah, man. I got several so, deaf cousins. I actually majored in sign language in community college for two semesters. My grandmother just died in June, this past June. She was ninety three years old. She didn't know uh sign language and she never wore hearing aids. And she was born she she was raised in the rural south. In the early nineteen like in the mid like nineteen thirties and forties. Imagine. Was she vocally communicative? Yeah, she could talk to you. Yeah. You wouldn't believe she was deaf if like if my grandmother was sitting right here right now, if she wasn't dead and she was sitting right here, you probably wouldn't know she was deaf until I tell you. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. there's definitely like I guess some people call it like the deaf accent where the words just don't have the full enunciation. Well, yeah, because they never heard a word enunciated a before. More, yeah. I mean, in some words, yeah, she she couldn't say certain words, but in in a general conversation, oh, she didn't have what, what you call, yeah, just deaf tone. Like, her yeah. speech was very, very good. Hmm. Yeah, it's amazing what people can uh, can do when people don't tell them they can't. No, but she heard, she went deaf when she was 11. Oh, okay. So she heard up, you know what I'm saying? So if you can hear, like if, if you if you if you're born deaf, yeah, your tone is deaf because you've never heard enunciation before. Right. Yeah, yeah, cuz all my cousins they speak clearly enough you could understand them with no problem, but you definitely be like, "Oh yeah, they're yeah, deaf." deaf. Yeah. And my cousin, she's married to this really cool dude. She born guy. deaf? Yep, born deaf. Yep. Um and her husband was too. And when he talks though, you it's you kind of have to like you got to think. Ta, ta, you got to think it. a little bit what he's yeah. saying and it usually comes out kind of loud too. Bless him. He's a great dude. And I love him. I <laughs> uh, that's how it is. I love him. But yeah. Uh, that just... people are cool when you get to know. Him. Yeah. Uh. What's really crazy though is being in the car on the highway with one of my cousins when they were driving. Because the whole time they're having a sign language conversation and driving. Driving. And you're like, are you? Ah. <laughs> I feel like they're looking at the person next to him more than half the time. But. Keep it right in the lanes. Never have to slow the brakes. They sense this. So if, if if his hearing is bad, yeah. What do you think his vision like? Oh, uh, eagle. Yeah. What do you think his, his senses are? You know, you lose one, you gain something and something else. Yeah. I, I will love it because I can see like a hawk. Or just spatial awareness. A lot of oh, people. Yeah, and my senses, right? I know. Yeah. I've, I've, I grew up in a rough neighborhood. I know when to leave. Yeah. Yeah. You know when, so, when something just doesn't start to feel right. Even if you don't know why, you're just like, I gotta go. Time to go, like, or just not even like it's just. Time. I just know when not to be be somewhere. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you'll be there. Nothing per, per se made me leave. Senses. Just destiny, I guess, or whatever made me just get up and go do whatever I did. Whether it was go get the bite to eat, go run t- to a store, go talk to a girl, whatever it was, drew me from a bad situation. Hmm. Yeah. And my senses have been able to do that for me for a while. Well, it sounds like you trust your intuition. Then, if I if I can pull something from that. 
Yeah, my auntie it, always told me that. Have you been that way a long time? Is it something? Because I'm 41. I was born in 83. Well, I will be 41 in uh, next month. Um, <clears throat> but as a younger person, I was not as... Maybe I was as vocal as I am now, but maybe just not as... <laughs> uh uh what what's the word wouldn't wouldn't say it in as pleasant of a way <laughs> you know what i mean um i was my my sixth grade teacher uh called me chatty kathy <laughs> you know what i'm saying so i've i've always been vocal yeah um <clears throat> i've never been shy i always had but i was i was always had friends people always always liked me so it was like it wasn't it wasn't a bad like to me, but I mean, as young, young growing up in hindsight now as a young man, yeah, I probably should have shut up a little bit more, <laughs> you know, but I've always been this way. All right, this next segment, we're going to talk about how he actually started getting into music. So uh, buckle up, silly. When did you start getting into music, like actively trying to either cover somebody's music or make your own, but like actually make music. Probably since I was born in 80, ever since I ever heard a hip hop record. Like, I mean, any record, but hip hop is in, in grand in me because from my recollection, I remember the Beastie Boys, mm -hmm. um, Run DMC, like Run D, uh, Beastie Boys, No Sleep to Brooklyn, um, Paul Revere, um, Run, Brass Monkey, um, Slick Rick, like everything I was hearing. Funky Junkie. Yeah, like I was hearing it, but I had the candy ability, like when I hear it, to know it. Like I was doing, I was able to do that at a young age. And, um, so probably, probably about, for real, about 85, 86, I was, I was already a hip hop junkie already. Yeah. yeah. So like, I could, I could hear your, your music and probably hear it like two, three times for real, hear your song and probably pretty much know most of it. Yeah. If I like it. Yeah. Hmm. I got into music. Like not really into music, but like listening to. I'm trying to remember when CDs became a thing because we're that age. So you talking ninety? Well, I was like ninety two, ninety three ish, maybe ninety. If, if you pushing it, maybe ninety five, because Garth Brook was making a killing off his CDs back then. <laughs> yeah, it was seriously. Even my dad bought some. My dad's not a country well, guy. When, when Garth, Brooke, it was funny because when um, Garth Brooks was king, CDs was at our all time high. When they seeing hip hop artists making all that money off CDs, the government lowered CDs to ten dollars. Hmm. That's wild. And I think in his entire <laughs> career, Garth Brooks has only written like four songs independently. Hey, you don't gotta write them; you just gotta be able to perform them and, and, and do the business right. Yeah, Garth was a bad dude, though. Yeah, yeah. That, dude, that dude can sing a song. Say maybe it's not. He, maybe he didn't write it, but that dude can sing a song. Garth he's a, Brooks he's never a claimed to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. He just played his role. Yeah. Right. He he wasn't a cocky dude, and from my understanding, or what I've seen of him, he was never just no. He didn't act like he was bigger than it than, the, than the, the genre or the culture. He just played his part, and he just just having to be very very successful with it. Yeah, like for real. So was the question about oh hip hop? Yeah, no, or music saying, or whatever. Before I started learning how to play music, I was like listening to the first CDs I got were probably like some Beatles CDs because my parents were like. Mm -hmm into that that time period of music and i thought that the beatles were the coolest thing from that time period from what they were listening to so my first couple cds were beatles cds and i started learning the words and kind of singing along and i'd pick up like my baseball bat and play air guitar and kind of try to imagine like oh would he be moving his hand up or down on the guitar it sounds like he's getting high. and that kind of got my musical inclinations from mimicry. you know mimicry of like some beatles songs and then got a guitar and started learning bar chords so i could play any nirvana song you know what i mean mm -hmm. And it just kind of grew out of that. Do you have something that's similar to that? Or is it just like singing along with the radio? Did you ever put together like a boxes and pots and pans drum set? Well, like I said, early on, just I just had the candy ability to be able to hear a song. And if it was good, I can, I can memorize it. So, and of course, you get a little older, fast forward. Like we didn't have, like you said, we didn't have MP3 players or, or, or Bluetooth speakers. To, yeah, you had the radio. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or even even then, like if we were, if we are on our bikes on our bike ride and we all hanging out, nobody had no big ass boom box probably on a bike, right? Right. So you didn't have music at that disposal. So like we used to, I don't know, I, 
how we grew up, we used to just rap songs. Of, you know what I'm saying? We all be riding our bikes or hooping or whatever. We'd be rapping the song. So then I know most of them. So then we got to a point where my one of my boys was like, bro, you know, everybody joins. Like, because when they want somebody to rap a song, they have me do it. Like, yo, yeah. I'll do this. Rap this one, bro. Rap this one. You you were the Alexa. Yeah, I, I was. I was the jukebox for my crew. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So like growing up, but everybody knew I love music. You know what I'm saying? Michael Jackson. Like I was very uh, influenced by Michael Jackson too. So like, it was the music always been around. Have you ever heard any of Michael Jackson's um, music demos where he just does like an acapella and oh, then yeah, gives that to somebody? Yeah. Those acapella demos of just like him doing the the music for Beat It or something like that. It's insane. Yeah, he don't. It's high art in and of itself, and it was for him just like a. You know, here, learn this and then play it so I can sing over it. So, but just imagine being on that level at six years old. Yeah. Well, I mean, that kid was born in. Oh, he's singing that fire, song. Though. Hold on, he's singing about. He's singing about being in love at six years old. Like he's experienced love. Well, yeah, but yeah, exactly. Well, that comes back to like that Garth Brooks thing. Like he might not might not have wrote this song, but man, he can make you believe he did. Yeah. That's, that's phenomenal, bro. Yeah. Yeah, so like, but it's still a mimicry though, right? But when, yeah, so when did it so, jump from like your friends just being like, hey, do, show them the thing to be like, you know what, maybe I need to like get a cassette and like record and listen to myself well, back or something like that. Well, how that happened was, so when my bro told me I should just start right, uh, rapping. Oh, hold on a second. And a cassette for anybody that's younger listening is the precursor to CDs and for... Anybody that doesn't remember what those are, it was the precursor to MP3s and streaming. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yep. So I've been, I, I've lived through all those eras. That's yeah. crazy. So um, I went from rapping, then my bro was like, "Man, you should try to, you know, um, you should start rapping because you know everybody's stuff." And they just happened. Up. Some of our homeboys was already kind of rapping already. So and then I just just happened. They was already in my crew or whatever. So I started doing that too. I just. What my boys was doing, right? Like, yeah. so we started started writing little raps. And then um, I moved back home. My cousin, he was real serious about rapping, and then I used to just be with him every day. So me and him was just write raps all the time. Just, I mean, for real, that's pretty much what we did: hustle and wrote raps and hustle and play basketball. And then just it became like every day. It was like a practice for a long time. Just my first first time I ever went to a studio to lay the verses, nineteen ninety seven. I remember where the studio was called DDK. It's right there on Union and um, and Michigan. Okay, so if I'm doing the math. You're still in high school at that point. Um, yeah, no, I was. I had a GED. I got my GED on my 17th birthday. So like, yeah. Okay, so right around that same time. Yep. Yeah, I was still a high school kid though. Technically, yeah, yeah, yep. seven, 17 years old. Yeah. I was 17. Yep. So, yep. Laid it at the studio. It's now a pizza parlor in that building right now. But yep, did that. Um, 97, about 97, 98, and then I was. My cousin did an uh, album or two. I was on that a few times. Did a few features on that. And then, um, yeah, we was recording after that. I was just recording. And then I didn't drop my, but the crazy part is I didn't drop a solo project from 97 from me first recording. I was just, I did a few features. But I never did have a solo project until 2021. Was that because there wasn't really a good opportunity or were you like okay i've heard what i sound like and now i want to get to here before i do it again no i think um <clears throat> what it was at first honestly was just the, the fine of uh, finances you know back then because that shit's not cheap i've well even, now we have the ability to do this ourselves yeah. but i went to a studio when uh before i was about to go to iraq i was like i should at least put some songs down so <laughs> If God forbid I die, people will be like, oh, well, you know, he he lived and here's a mark of his creativity. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and yeah, that was not cheap. That was like a a paycheck for a couple of hours in the studio. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm saying. So back then it was really expensive. Like in the late 90s, early 2000s, studio sessions wasn't cheap. So you you got to think we were either putting them on, uh, pressing them up the CD or like you said, they're still on cassette, right? Mm -hmm. You got to... You gotta get a photographer. It wasn't cheap to even get a picture to to make an art a cover art, right? And then you gotta get this pressed up. So it wasn't it wasn't cheap. So I didn't have the finances and my my life wasn't stable enough for me to be able to produce. But I always maintained, but I always rapped. Like well, well, did you <clears throat> I know um a friend of mine, his name is Justin Smith. Shout out to Justin. Smitty. What's up, Smitty? 
Uh, what up, Smitty? <laughs> when uh, when he was in high school, him and a couple of guys got together and started a uh, just like a, a independent punk rock music label, mm-hmm. and they got together enough money. Like I, I don't know if they had the money raised somehow or if they convinced all the bands to like give them ten bucks, but they found somebody who would press like ten thousand CDs for criminally low per cd Mm -hmm. and they got all these bands like 20 something bands one song each on there and then they gave all the bands so many copies and they all just tried to sell as many as they could and that was like the way to maximize that like Mm -hmm. i can be on a full ass album with exposure hopefully these other people are out there pushing it like i'm gonna um i'll just be I'll, i'll just be on there for three and a half minutes but that's but, how I'm going to so, get it out. So, there. so you basically like so in a bigger scheme. Look, we got we got mass produced CDs, right? Yeah. Your single is on here. That's what that's what the artist should be looking at. Like my single's on here. Yeah. If I can sell, if I'm getting a mass produce and I'm selling them for pennies, so I'm really just pitching my single. It just happened to be on the album. Yeah. You're just throwing throwing a line out. Who yeah. wants it? So that was that was pretty clever. Yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. so yeah, that was that was really the way for a lot of people, and I know. A lot of those bands would get together and be like, "Oh, so and so is putting together." You know what we a, call a that mix. in hip hop. You know what they call that in hip hop. You know mixtapes. <laughs> yeah. Come on, so right. Yeah. Mixtape. They was he, yeah. they was doing mixtapes back then. We called them compilation albums. Yeah. Hmm. Or soundtracks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Movies had the soundtracks. It was mm-hmm. a good movie. Had to have the soundtracks back then. Oh man, and we're old enough to remember movies where they didn't have soundtracks. They just had a guy with a keyboard who would just <laughs> play all oh, the background music. <laughs> but shout out though, it did give us do 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 do. What? Man, what? <laughs> we got a lot of shit though. Uh, I think that's the only reason that a lot of movies from the eighties that we probably saw on TV when we were little don't stand up today is because they've got they sound like Atari awful Atari soundtracks. music. Yeah. But then you've got a couple of them that still work. But like you watch a movie like John Candy, Who's Harry Crumb? And anytime there's an action sequence, that's. If I watch Gleam in the Cube, that used to be my favorite movie. Christian, he used to be the skateboard kid. Gleam in the Cube was a skateboard movie. I bet if I watch it now, it's corny. I bet it is. I'm going to try to find it and watch it. Take this time, if you haven't already, to go follow this man on social media, people. Next, we start by talking about when he got real serious about music. When you started getting um, real serious about trying to get recorded and start finding ways to get yourself out there, what were you listening to at the time? What was what was real big and what, uh, what do you think, looking back, maybe kind of came through in some of your music where you can say... I used to hear a little bit of this. My uh, as far as hip hop for real, like my bar is Nas. Um, it's always been my bar. Um, Nas, my cousin. So wait, do you, did you take a side with Nas, and are you like fuck Jay Z, or are you like both? I'm t- I was I'm talking about even long before Jay Z and Nas beef. Like Nas was my standard. Like not, Illmatic came out like ninety four, ninety five. I was fifteen years old. Like that that album changed my life. Like that, that changed the way I looked at rap and made me want to rap, like for real. Mm. So, like, yeah, Illmatic. So, like, Nas is my bar for us. Why I want the rap when I knew I want the rap. Yeah. Like, LL Slick Rick done made me love rap, but Nas made me want to rap. It just reminded me of a meme I saw the other day. It was like a little kid sitting in front of a TV. <laughs> and it was like, me seeing a new uh, music video drop when I was 11 years old. Mm-hmm. And it's do, 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 boom. And then the girl's, uh, and the kid's <laughs> face just goes. <laughs> what? No porn joints. Uh, the doing it well video was probably for an 11 year old. The LL joint? Yeah. Yeah. Doing it, doing it, and doing it. Wow. Representing Queens, like raised out in Brooklyn. Yeah, he was going off on that. That was kind of expensive for a of, kid. There was a lot of sexy songs in hip hop back then. But it, one thing it was, it was coded though, right? Like now everything is direct, straight to the point. Yeah. So now you got 
bitch, I'm about to pop this pill. Fuck you. Woo, woo, woo. And back then it was <laughs> back then it was more. It was more. I mean, even the girls rappers telling. Listen to what the girl rappers are rapping about. Like, come on, like a. Or just, One margarita, or, yeah. Or, or what they singing about, or, or just in, women in general. Like they, they, these women are more direct with you now than they ever been. Right. Yeah. Let's cut to the chase. They don't want a relationship sometimes either. Sometimes Although, they might just want to screw you. Lil Kim was always pretty direct. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that too. Like, but she wasn't. I mean, she was the first in maybe in commercialized hip hop, but they've done women like that. They sexualize women in every aspect all the time anyway. So it wasn't nothing yeah. new. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. So like I said, this the shit ain't changed. Mm-hmm. It ain't changed, bro. Just we we able to see it now. You know better. Mm-hmm. Now now you have a view or a stance about it. You know I don't, I don't want to tell a woman what she can't and can't say, but I just know certain things I wouldn't want for certain women in my family or the women in my family. So yeah. that's how I, you know that's how I look at it. So it's yeah. just you know yeah, which has got to be. <laughs> I remember one time my dad knocked on my door. He's like, what are you listening to? I was like, Easy E. <laughs> and he just kinda he was just kinda like had this look on his face where like I thought he was gonna be like, turn it off, but he was just kinda like and walked out and it, I think the song that was playing at the time was um Gimme That Nut. See. I wasn't I I wasn't I wasn't a big NWA fan for real. Yeah. I wasn't. Yeah. I think they was a little at my age, they was too vulgar for me. And, and uh, you talking about a kid that lived in the in the ghetto and, and uh, heard a lot of vulgar. Like that was just like when I was coming up. That I guess I was still a kid in, in certain ways, like Slick Rick. And at that time, you talking about eighty eight, eighty nine. Uh, yeah, I'm listening to more Slick Rick and MC Light yeah. back then, and I well, was NWA. I grew up just outside of Lansing in the suburbs in a place called Okemos, and I think probably us. <laughs> Those bands got pushed harder just because, like, everybody was like, don't listen to NWA. I like, mean, yeah, because it was commercial oh, success. Don't listen to NWA? Well, I'm going to go, let me go do that. <laughs> That's crazy. So how was you getting a hold of NWA? Like, at your age, how was you even getting NWA? Um, Actually, I think that one was on a CD that somebody else had burned, a, you know, a mixed tape, but a mixed CD. Oh, then you just had it? And mm-hmm. then I just had that, yeah. Okay. We used to do that a lot still when I was in high school. People would, you oh, know, like around high school, like, time. And... See, I'm, 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 I'm talking about like in real time. I'm thinking you're talking about like when, like in 88, like, because like you said, you was born in what, 84? 83. 83. Yeah. So no, like, no, so I was NWA, like, like when they was popular for real, like in 88, 89, when they was really like in real time. Yeah. yeah. I remember them summers. Like I wasn't listening to that because it, it just did. It just sounded too, a little too grown for me and too. Like, as a kid, it just wasn't my type of music. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, like, like I said, I was more into different stuff. Yeah, they were. Uh, I, tribe called. Uh, I don't know why. Like it's kind of fascinating, but they really. Well, I mean, I guess I do know why. But they really wanted to push gangster rap on, like, MTV and into, like, white what you culture. You think, what, what was, what was uh, hip-hop's message before gangster rap? It was Black Power Movement. It was talking, um... You gotta, you gotta, you gotta li- listen to what the science was. They was, they was pushing a five percent nation knowledge. That's what, that's what it was. It was independence. You know what I'm saying? Knowing who you who, is. Who are we talking about? What, which artists the, are you talking if, about? If you, if you look at the founding fathers of hip hop, what were they? They were five percenters. Five percent nation. Like yeah, they was. Cool Herc and all them brothers, they yeah. Zulu Nation and all them, yeah. They was, they was on, uh, they was, yeah. That's what hip hop was created for. It's supposed to be the voice of the voiceless, right? For the, the ghettos is the people that's less financed, that's broke, that's poor. That's, that's what they created that for. To, to have, like you said, it was partying, yeah. To forget about the harsh reality of what they was living in, yeah. You know what I'm saying? They was living in ghettos with lead in the walls and crazy shit and rats and roaches running around. You know what I'm saying? So mm. that's what that's where hip hop came from. Like hip hop, like I said, hip hop wasn't made to be cool. Like it wasn't it wasn't the, something to do because it was cool. It was a way to spread a social message. Yeah, you know what so, I'm saying? Uh, social message. Social message, and just and just the social message, and also like let's let's forget about whatever we're going through right now. We just finna party and listen to this good music. Like you said, this good music, right? Yeah. Good vibes. They took old records their parents had, just like you were saying. Took old records. Then they found out they could reverse them. You <laughs> yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah. They just taught, like, they just created a whole culture from nothing. Mm-hmm. 
to just forget about the hard times we having. A rapper wasn't even the main thing when hip hop started, right? Right. Oh man, there was a movie that used to be on HBO all of the time, and it was specifically about DJs who were scratching back in the probably mid late eighties in New York. Right. So when you when you watch Crush Groove and Beat Street break breaking these movies. I grew up when these movies came out in real time. Like I used to watch them. Yeah. I watched Breaking One and Two. I watched uh, Disorderly by the Fat Boys. I watched Tougher Than Leather by <laughs> Red DMC. Yeah. Like I really watched these movies as a kid in real time. They was um, Ed Lover and Dr. Dre. Who's the Man movie? Like I used to watch all that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. In real time. So man, always man, hip hop always been like I love hip hop, bro. Like that's all I ever did. Yeah, like that's my that's my life. All right, folks, this is the part of the podcast where I usually take a dive into the necessity of creativity and kind of try to coax out creativity out of somebody who's listening who maybe has creativity in them but isn't letting it out. So if that's you, listen to this part. This part's for you. Part of this podcast exists, I think, in terms of uh, trying to like motivate people who have a guitar at home but haven't played it in five years like pick that thing up you know what i mean it's not about getting on the billboard top tens always it's about just exploring how you feel through uh some kind of artistic medium it's funny right i rap at the age i do in, in, a, in a in a genre that's that's not friendly at all to people my age right it's hip-hop is a young man's genre yeah we should say right but guess where I get all my love and support from? Majority of it. From the youth. Hmm. Right? We got to stop, like, we, we be cutting up. We always in, in our own way. Yeah. Right? In we, terms of we as individuals are in our own way? Like, as a culture, yeah. We be in our own way as, as human beings. Okay. Like, I didn't know if you meant, like, creatively, like, sometimes people. Even, even creatively. People like, try to hold out opportunities for other people because they're afraid they won't like, get as Like, many. we're talking about people that's either creative or people that got the, the skill set that won't, right? Yeah, yeah. You brave enough and you have the courage enough and enough go ahead to purchase your own equipment and, and start your own podcast. You Instead of sitting on the couch critiquing everybody else's podcast, you say, like, because <laughs> that's what most people do. Yeah. Right. Or anybody I mean, that's trying that's, to critique this podcast. That's what right? a lot of Twitter is, right? Oh man, this person yeah. sucks. Oh, this show sucks. I hate this. But they've never they've never done it or never even attempted to, right? So like and then I I I, I would I don't want to live with regrets of I should have tried or I wonder what'd happen if I'd have did this and I wonder what'd happen if yeah. I don't want to live like that. And then too, like I'm just good at what I do. Evidently, people like it. Right, so I ain't forcing nothing on nobody. People are asking me for the music, so yeah, I'm giving it to them. It's not like I'm. It's a difference between trying to make money and prop and prop, like a, what we call clout chasing. Like if you're doing this for attention, I don't I don't care necessarily to be famous. But when you talk about hip hop and Grand Rapids, I want, to, want my name to speak like in ring bells. Like when you talk about Grand Rapids hip hop, like yeah. oh yeah, he, Alfie the Great, like he one of them ones. Mm -hmm. It's not about being better than nobody. It's not about being the greatest of all time or whatever. I want I want I want to be cemented as one of the best or one of the I want to be one of the found foundation that hold this hip hop up in Grand Rapids. I want to be remembered forever. Yeah. Like I don't want you to be able to say Grand Rapids hip hop and not not speak my name in a positive light. Like dude was really he was really for us. I think creative people especially need to I mean everybody needs to hear it, but for this podcast sake, creative people need to hear like um, eh. he's high ladies and gentlemen that'll be an edit hmm. right there and, I, and yeah. I peaked I just seen it we'll edit that too though yeah alright folks by this time we were pretty high shout out to Farmhouse Wellness for uh, getting us there uh, and then uh, I'll just push into our wrap up here. All right. Well, hey, man. Thanks for uh, letting me sit down with you. I appreciate it. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate you. 
All right, everybody. That was Alfie the Great. I had to cut out like 10, 15 minutes off the end because, uh, as Alfie alluded to there, I was too high to keep talking. (laughs) But I had a great time talking with Alfie the Great. I hope someday soon we get to uh, collaborate on some music and hang out again. Really nice guy. Really talented musician. And uh, he's he's a man of the people. He's here for us. He's here for the culture. He's, uh, He's a real one. Stay tuned here, and I will go ahead and play you the rest of that song of his called Different Clout. Welcome to the valley, put the heat to your mom clear On some Mike Jack shit, I remember the times here New year, new me, like we standing in Times Square Amputating legs, ain't no kicking, no rhymes here Shoes too big, y'all can't fit in these size 12 Besides stepping taxes, we no snitches in time tail Swag on cheek, hold your chick on my clock still Ain't got a full shit, man, the kid play his part well Air drop the bag, Rams coming through parcel Stamp with a seal, the connect from the cartel The team, it was one, we was in with a bar Stills. Even if you hate me, gotta rank me as top tier I'm never ducking smoke, motherfuckers, I'm right here Any wrong move, I check you pussies like pap smears There's levels to the shit and I'm just here to make that clear It's my year We got different clout, what the fuck the riffs about? It's only getting worse, I used to try to hear him out Sometimes you let him in just so you can hear him out As far as rappers go, I done killed a fair amount we got different clout, what the fuck the riffs about? It's only getting worse, I used to try to hear him out. Sometimes you let them in just so you can hear him out. As far as rappers go, I done killed the fair amount. Everybody know me, I'm authentic, ain't gotta do much. Flow tough, my boss frigid from the mud side did it. It's some question how y'all get it, you'll see in due time. If y'all gimmicks forever pull my weight, you can say that I'm all tending. Soul of the silly, don't be silly, I'm all Flemish. The Wonderland ruler, take your head, then I'm off with it. Switch hit and never, that's the message that y'all sending. Walls in my blood, I'm from a hood where they all hit us. Never had a doubt, you see my talent is raw given. The school of hard knocks, so you know I'm a bar spitter. Champagne and reaper, I'll pass on the hard liquor. Made in this likeness, so you looking at raw with it. Blind as a bat, but still can see that you raw with it. My poker face. On. I'm just playing my cards with it No matter what the stakes, I'm defeating the odds with it It's easy We got different clout, what the fuck the riffs about? It's only getting worse, I used to try to hear him out Sometimes you let him in, just so you can hear him out As far as rappers go, I done killed a fair amount We got different clout, what the fuck the riffs about? It's only getting worse, I used to try to hear him out Sometimes you let him in, just so you can hear him out As far as rappers go, I done killed a fair amount we got different clout, what the fuck the riffs about? It's only getting worse, I used to try to hear him out. Sometimes you let him in, just so you can hear him out. As far as rappers go, I done killed a fair amount. We got different clout, what the fuck the riffs about? It's only getting worse, I used to try to hear him out. Sometimes you let him in, just so you can hear him out. As far as rappers go, I done killed a fair amount. 